now to get to the fun part. Uh, today we'll be uh, discussing this recurring favorite, which will feature 50 tech tips for project management, collaboration, communication, and more, including resources to help get you started on that summer project that you've been putting off. And we will also include homegrown tools and resources developed by and for the legal aid community and sources of nationally relevant content and videos that programs have made available for community use. And please feel free to share your favorite tips in the chat too. So with that, I'm going to introduce our presenters. Uh, today we have Tim Ng joining us from Legal Aid Association of California, along with Jenny Singleton from Minnesota Legal Services State Support, Jesse Pasolkin from Legal Services Corporation, Anna Heinlein from Lonnie, and myself, Jillian Thiel from Pro Bono Net. And we've also got Brian Rowe and uh, Kat Ng from LSN Tap on today's call. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Tim to kick us off. All right, let's just jump into it then. Um, so the first part is talking about password security. In the first row, you see um, some of the traditional methods for um, getting passwords. I'm sure you've all encountered um, requirements that ask you to put numerals or special characters and capital letters. Um, and even though it's, it can be a little bit more secure, um, from people who are trying to guess normal words. Um, they tend to be pretty short, and therefore um, brute force attacks on passwords can be somewhat successful. And the, the, the important thing is that they're also really hard to remember. So and if people end up writing them on Post-it notes and putting them at their desk, which is a huge you know, security problem, or they'll end up setting um, passwords by email to people who need them and can't remember them, or having to write them down in some other place. Um, an alternative would be the bottom row, which you see um, you have just a string of words that um, don't relate to each other but are somewhat easy to remember because they're unique or they're personal to you in some way. Um, so if you have um, four or five words that um, increases the um, size of your password and decreases the likelihood that a brute force attack will um, be able to crack your password. Of course, if um, the words you're using are, are related to your work or they're easily guessable, um, or they're related to each other, then it might be a little easier to guess. And, um, but it's just an alternative way to use passwords that might um, just give you more security and make passwords easier to remember and, and avoid people putting them in Post-it notes. Um, next, we have Goodbye Backspace, which is a Chrome extension. Um, I've been in situations before where I'm typing something out and I misclick outside of my email or uh, some other field and I press the backspace. and Chrome thinks that I want to go back to the previous page and it uh, loses all the information I was typing out. So uh, this extension essentially uh, uh, cancels that function and lets you type freely without worrying about mispressing backspace and sending you off the form or the email or the chat that you were just in, uh, especially if you were in Gmail somewhere um, and the draft wasn't saved. So um, it's all, this is all in the Chrome uh, App Store for, for, um, for Google. Next is the Great Suspender. Um, this is um, really helpful if you're using Chrome to manage multiple tabs and you like to have tons of tabs open uh, when you're using Google Chrome. Um, unfortunately, Google Chrome is known for using almost all of your computer's memory and just being a huge memory hog. So if you have tons of tabs open, um, your computer will run quite slowly um, com compared to Firefox or Internet Explorer. Um, so Great Suspender is kind of a attempt to solve that problem by just suspending certain tabs that you aren't actively using if they're inactive for a certain period, uh, for example, an hour, 30 seconds, or a minute. Um, it'll suspend those tabs and um, save some of your computer's resources to free up and um, to use for other things and just to speed things up. And this is also through a, a Chrome extension in the, in the Google Play Store. Next, we have Pointer Focus, which is a little software that I can use for uh, presentations and webinars, a lot of training is happening in the summer and um, in the fall, and um, Pointer Focus is just a, a, a better way than a lot of times what exists in native presentation software. So Pointer Focus has a um, um, highlight function, a spotlight function, which um, dims the rest of the screen and, and only lights up the section you want people to see. Um, On-screen annotations, so you can write things with a pen and highlight things, um, and also uh, less popular, the, the screen magnifier function um, and the keystroke visualization. 
Um, the, the, most, the most important thing is just the, um, the highlight points, which is um, very useful. And there are also keyboard shortcuts so that you um, turn that highlight on or off um, freely. Next is TinyPNG. Um, this is just a, a handy software uh, uh, for compressing image files, especially when you want to embed things in emails or attach them or uh, put them onto um, web pages. Uh, it, it usually cuts somewhere between 30 to 80 percent of the size of a file and just makes things load faster and um, upload faster when you're trying to send things across email or um, put them in line into a Word document or any kind of document you're working with. Um, this is really helpful mostly just for PNG files and I try to avoid J, uh, J, JPEGs or JPGs um, because they tend to be a little low, lower quality and they don't handle compression very well. Next is um, msconfig. Um, you can access this from your start menu. You just um, in the run in the run menu, you, you type in msconfig and it'll search for this program, and you can click it on. Um, just note that this is um, for administrators, so you might not have administrative access to your computer, and um, it, you should be pretty careful with using this. But if you are noticing that when you start your computer and there's a ton of things that um, launch automatically that you can't seem to disable, um, you can go into this and select which startup um, programs you want to turn off or turn on. And it's also just good to have a look at and see what's automatically being turned on when your computer is um, starting up in the morning and just making sure that there's nothing that rogue or anything that you unwanted that may be eating up a lot of your uh, computer's memory and, and resources. You can also use this um, to see the services that are currently running. Um, it's a more advanced way to look at the tasks that are currently running for your computer. And um, yeah, just make sure that it's you, know, you don't mess with anything um, that you don't want to mess with. So check in with someone who might know better first. Next is the task scheduler. Um, you can also run this from the start menu, search for task scheduler, and it should pop up. This is good for um, scheduling things like virus scans and updates. Um, and also you can tell your computer to turn off automatically every day. So you can uh, create a task on the right-hand side and um, hopefully the, the, help, the help menu is, is very helpful in this way and the wizard is, is self-explanatory. So you can tell your computer to turn itself off every day after a certain period of time. Um, if you're inactive for you know, half an hour or an hour, the computer will detect that and then turn itself off automatically. And you can also schedule things like defragmentation for your hard drive um, and a, another virus scan. Another popular thing that I, I been noticing is suppressing the Ask Toolbar um, update when you update Java. Java updates roll out very, very often, it seems, um, you know, almost every week nowadays. And every time um, users have to opt out of the Ask Toolbar, um, and you have to click on the actual checkbox to opt out of it. And sometimes people just kind of press OK and they keep going. Um, and, you know, they have to and they end up installing Ask Toolbar accidentally, and they have to uninstall it later on. Another question about um, MS Config. Um, yeah, that is for Microsoft and Windows only. Um, I, I don't know if there's a similar function for Mac. Um, oh, there you go. There's a, there you go. Um, and Nine Night is just um, a, a user a community um, uh, informed. Um, software package for a bunch of different tools and, and software that new computers and laptops and, and netbooks might use. Um, so you have uh, everything, you can, you can select things um, and save them and then have them all bundled into one convenient package. So instead of having to list them all, remember what you need to install, install when you're doing a fresh install or you're um, updating, uh, getting a new computer, um, you just have everything bundled at once. Um, and you can have them just unload them all at the same time instead of having to um, go through step by step with each software and thinking about trying to remember what you use for um, different computers. Last is um, using Google Drive, um, especially when you're trying to collaborate um, on documents and you're working with people who um, aren't using Google Docs, you can still attach things um, through Google Drive. And this is an alternative to using the paperclip option on the bottom left and uploading files every time you want to attach something. 
Um, so instead, you, you would use Google Drive. You would upload your documents to Google Drive um, and then attach them through Google Drive as an attachment instead of a link to the document on Google Drive. So because the files are automatically are already loaded into Google Drive, and if you're using Gmail, um, Google will, in, instead of uploading the files every time from your hard drive, they will just um, attach it from your uh, Google Drive storage. Last is Google Domains. So we use Google Domains because um, a lot of the domain registrar's quality has decreased over time, and um, many of us may have registered with older companies that used to be good but aren't no, are no longer because they've grown or the support has fallen off. And Google has stepped in um, as a, both a, as mostly as a service provider, and they although they aren't a registrar for domains, so they'll still contract out um, the, the registration but they offer a, a better level of support and a dashboard that's just a lot easier to use. And um, that, that's it for my tech tips. Thanks. Uh, so there are a few comments here. First, um, for the system admin um, type things, the Mac equivalent is in the uh, notes in the chat. Um, additionally, there was a question about um, is Google Drive a secure site? Um, I vaguely recall that there's confidentiality issues. Um, so on the uh, confidenti confidentiality site, um, Google Drive definitely um, can be set up to where it's secure. It defaults to HTTPS um, currently. Um, so yes, you can set it up um, to be secure. If you are um, in a lawsuit with uh, Google, uh, I wouldn't recommend it because their robots have access to um, the things that you are storing there, and there isn't a way to opt out of that. Um, but generally, um, it is secure as other um, cloud service providers. The same thing you're looking at for uh, Office 365 or other things to that effect. Great. So my name is Jenny Singleton, and I'm with Legal Services State Support in Minnesota. Um, and I'll be walking through a few tech tips as well. The first tech tip is uh, using Strict Workflow, which is a Chrome extension. And this is based on the Pomodoro technique, um, which is, if you're not familiar with, um, is based on 25 minutes of work and then a five minute break, um, just as a way for you to keep distractions to five minutes uh, during the break and, and stay a bit more focused on what you're doing. So the way the extension works is it um, aids you in keeping on track with that uh, by blocking certain websites. And it, when you install it, there are default websites that are um, blocked automatically that you can't change. And then you can also customize it by adding additional websites um, and customizing uh, how long you'll, how long you'll, you'll uh, be working and how long you'll have a break. Um, and to, it's just a simple timer that will install on your browser um, in the upper right-hand corner, and you just click on it to start the 25-minute timer, and then again to start the five-minute break timer. Um, one thing to note with this is that um, you can't change the websites that are blocked during the 25-minute work period. Um, so I've run into issues where I needed to access a, a website that was on my blocked list. Um, so then you have to wait uh, until your break period comes, or you have to uninstall the extension. Um, but I found it to be a useful way to, to stay on track. The next tip is a pretty simple one, but um, just using Chrome's bookmark manager to keep all of your sites organized. Um, so uh, it's, there's a pretty intuitive and easy way to uh, combine all of your sites into different folders. Um, and then with Chrome, uh, this will sync across different uh, computers and devices. Uh, so this is really nice for me when I'm working for, from home uh, because I still have access to the same browser setup, which is what I'm primarily working with uh, during the day. And I just have mine uh, organized into work and home uh, with different folders underneath there. Uh, the next tip is using Boomerang for Gmail, which is something that I just recently started using. Um, and I don't actually use this for work since we use Outlook at work but I do have a few Gmail accounts for other purposes that I use this for. Um, and there are a couple of different things that you can do with Boomerang. Um, the first is 
you can uh, schedule emails to go out at a certain time. And then the other thing, which is what I really like it for, is to send you reminders. Um, so that can work for both emails that are sent to you and emails that are sent out. Uh, so for example, if you have an email that you receive in your inbox that you're not ready to uh, respond to or you need to revisit in a week, you can uh, use Boomerang to have it resend and star, uh, star the email into your email, into your uh, Gmail inbox uh, in one week. Uh, you can also, for emails that you're sending out, um, set Boomerang to uh, give you a reminder uh, if you don't get a reply for that email or if um, Boomerang detects that the person hasn't opened the email, um, which is a good way to prevent something that sometimes happens to me where you send out an email uh, and you cross that task off your list, but then you never hear back. Um, so it just makes sure that you're uh, following up with that. Uh, the, there is a free version, and that allows you to manipulate uh, up to 10 emails a week. If you want to use it for more than that, then uh, you have to get a paid subscription. Uh, the next tip is using uh, OneNote stopped to-do list. Um, and this is also just another simple uh, tech tip. Uh, for those of you that use OneNote, um, it's part of a uh, part of Windows um, and the to-do list. Uh, I, so I create uh, a to-do list for every work day. Um, I have uh, a tab for every month and then a OneNote page for every day of that month um, with tasks that I need to do. Um, and then you can dock that uh, list so that it's always showing on your, uh, on your desktop by clicking uh, Control-Alt-C which will dock it to the right-hand side. Um, and then a couple other shortcuts um, is Control-1, which can create a checkbox. Check and then uh, you can use Control-Shift-1 uh, to create a task, which will then also um, cross-populate it to your, your task list in your Outlook. Two quick questions here. One is, um, are you saying that uh, Chrome organizes your bookmarks or just syncs them between uh, platforms? Chrome just syncs them. You have to do the organization yourself. Um, okay. So you can by just dragging a URL into the toolbar. Um, and then there's also a bookmark manager that you can access. Excellent. And uh, we also did a full training on OneNote about a month ago. The video is up on our YouTube channel. I'll drop a link to that, but OneNote is wonderful. Agreed, awesome. So the next tool that I recently started using is Draw.io. Um, and this is basically a, a cloud-based uh, flowchart tool. Um, and I use this uh, when working on a hot docs interview with a couple of attorneys and one of the attorneys actually started using it and introduced it to me. Um, so it's basically a really simple, intuitive uh, tool to make flowcharts with drag and drop uh, shapes and arrows. Um, and then you can also, you know, highlight things and write comments uh, associated with different um, different boxes. Um, and then you can save your diagram um, in the cloud through Google Drive, which is what I use. Um, you can also use Dropbox, um, a browser, or um, also just save it to, to your own device. Um, so this is really nice uh, if people are working on different um, document assembly interviews with attorneys because it's a nice way to work back and forth with how the actual interview logic will be structured. Next tip is um, using Z to do basic coding. Um, for those of you who uh, do some admin work for your pro justice or law help or other websites, uh, but don't necessarily have um, an HTML coding experience, um, this is a good kind of beginner uh, tool, I think. And basically, it makes it easier to see what you're doing with, when you're working with HTML or different kinds of code. Um, so if you see the blue script uh, tag right here, uh, if you clicked on that in the program, uh, it would also highlight the end tag, uh, which is really useful to make sure you're getting the basics down. Um, and I downloaded this one because it's um, a Google Chrome app, 
which meant that I didn't have to go through my organization's IT department to get additional software downloaded um, to be able to do this. Uh, so since it's an app, it's not something that you're, um, that you're actually installing onto your computer. Next is Notability. And this is an app that I've just started testing out, but one of my most tech savvy friends um, uses this a lot and, and keyed me into it. Um, but basically, it's a way to sync audio with notes that you're taking. So it's used a lot in the educational context, um, but I think it, it can be a great tool uh, if you're going to different presentations. Uh, and the way it works is that the app will record uh, audio, and then as it's recording, you're taking notes. Um, you can also draw things, import um, different files or images, and then you can go back into the app at a later time and go to a particular note, and it'll be synced with the audio from the presentation um, so that you can also hear what was said uh, while you were taking that note. Um, and interesting, this was first developed uh, to help hearing impaired folks um, because it amplified the sound, and then they kind of developed more functionality out of that. Um, so this is not a free one. You have to pay $3.99 for it. Um, but it, from what I've heard from people who have used it, it it's worth the, the few dollars. The next tip is Wonderlist, uh, which is basically a to-do list that can sync across your devices and also in a web browser. Um, so for all of your tasks, you can uh, add different uh, due dates reminders, and then also subtasks underneath each task. Um, and then you can also add comments, files, and notes for each task. Uh, and then you can, for uh, the various tasks lists that you have, you can uh, organize those into different folders. Uh, there's also a Chrome extension that works with Wonderlist uh, that allows you to quickly uh, add in uh, different articles or websites um, as tasks are associated. And then you can also uh, highlight text within a web page and then click on the Wonderlist uh, Chrome extension button. And it'll add that web page as a task and then include the highlighted portion as a note associated with that task. Next is Workflowy, which is basically just a very simple web-based um, to-do list organizer. Um, so you go in and uh, it's basically a way to make quick bulleted lists. Um, for each main bullet point, uh, you can click on that bullet point and be taken to uh, a screen that will only show you that bullet point and then all the sub-bullet points with that, uh, with that main item. Um, so it's just a very simple, um, to-do list organizer um, uh, that is, is really easy to manipulate um, and a good way to, to kind of organize your thoughts. Uh, next is Asana, uh, which again is something that I haven't used yet, but um, one of my friends has used quite a bit uh, on working with um, group projects. But this is something uh, that you can use when you're working on a project uh, with a team. Um, and it basically will organize everything associated with that project into one place. Uh, so things are organized by project within Asana. And then uh, for each project, you can add different tasks. And then you can add uh, comments. You can add responsible people, due dates, attachments, uh, notifications for each of those tasks. Um, there's also uh, a way to communicate in real time with people um, within each project uh, and then uh, upload documents or other files that are associated with that project. Um, so it's kind of like a holding place for, um, for everything that's associated with a project. And you can get all the files, all the to-do lists, um, all the communication stored in one place. Um, so for this, you, you do need to make sure that everybody on your team is uh, logged in and working on within this platform, um, because I think that's the only way that it would really be useful, uh, which might be a hurdle. But 
I think that it could be a pretty powerful tool if you got everybody on board. Um, my final tech tip is to take a break. Um, this is a Google Street View of where I take a walk every day. Um, and I do this uh, especially when I get stumped on uh, different technology pieces, like working with hot dogs or something. Um, and it, it does wonders. Uh, so that, that is it for me. Good. Moving on to Jesse Fasolkin from Legal Services Corporation. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jesse Fasilkin. I work at the Legal Services Corporation, um, and I am going to echo many of the things that Jenny said, I think. Um, but the first is my preferred to-do list option. I know there are 900 different kinds of to-do list tools, um, and one of the ones that I really love is something called Trello, um, which basically is a, a cross between something called a Kanban board and what I think of as whiteboards or large post-it notes. Um, so here, um, it's a little cut off, I'm sorry, in my screenshot, but you can have different boards that you share with different people. So here, for instance, is uh, the page that I use to organize uh, some potential projects for our summer intern. So there are suggestions and ideas, ones that were actually assigned, and then when they're done, um, he or she or I could drag them over to the done column. Um, you can put different people on each card, um, and that way it, it keeps track of things. So it, it's a project management tool, but I find it to be a bit more lightweight uh, than something big like Basecamp. Um, it has some reminders, but it's not super great at that. Um, so I think if you want, a, you know, something like Asana is a little more intensive, um, though easy to set up. And I, I found Trello to be uh, a little more lightweight if you just need something to keep a group um, together. Uh, and we also use it actually for our um, at weekly meetings on our team where people can just add a card if they have something they want to talk about. Uh, the next tool that I love is, like many others, a Chrome extension, um, and it's called OneTab. So I am a person who ends up having um, 900 tabs open during the day. And at the end of the day, I may still want to have two or three of them open, links to read or something else that I want to remember to check out. So one tab, when you press the button, condenses them all into, uh, as you can see in this image, uh, a bunch of a big list. And as you click each link, it takes it off your list. So it's sort of using um, tabs as to-do list, um, while also, as you can see in their lovely ad, reducing uh, the memory that your browser is using. Uh, so it's something I use pretty much every day. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is something called GitHub, but I like to suggest that it be used for non-coding uh, projects. So GitHub is an, uh, an open, meaning public, code repository that lots of different folks ranging from the government to the private sector um, use to store and edit and collaborate on code. Um, and so the, an example of this that I saw recently was an article in Bloomberg News about code. Um, it was just about, I think, the, the world, that tech world in general. And so someone um, submitted a change to the article. So they posted it on GitHub, and she wrote um, comments. So it didn't go in the comment section of the article. That's not where it went. But it was, you know, here's something that she wanted to change about the article and uh, could submit that change. And then, uh, as, as you can see from this slide, Paul, the author, um, ended up actually uh, using that in his piece. Um, so I think if you're working on a big collaborative document with a lot of people from uh, lots of different parts of the world, so not just in your own organization, you may want to take uh, feedback or comments, but might not want to incorporate all of it. And you might want to give people more space than you might just in uh, a Google Doc comment section. And I think that this, uh, this allows you to do that nicely. Um, it does it in public, which to me I think is a benefit, but obviously uh, other, other folks may not find that to be a benefit. So uh, you do want to be clear. Someone could find whatever you're putting online. Um, great. The next thing, oh no, oh there it is, whew, um, is Smartsheet. Um, which is another, I, we use it here at LSC in collaboration with Trello. So Trello is sort of the big overview. And here's a, here's a draft implementation plan for, we're going to be rolling out Box and Salesforce here over the summer. Um, so here's a draft of the plan. Uh, in this view of it, it just looks like a spreadsheet. Um, and you can, th this is one of the templates that they have. Uh, Smartsheet is free to start, and I think that 
I don't remember what we pay for it. Something nominal, uh, a few bucks a month, I think. Uh, it's it's a freemium product, so you can add more money or add you know add more features with, with uh, more more uh, for more money. And uh, anyway, so here's the spreadsheet. Um, and then if you want, you can turn it into a Gantt chart if that's your preferred mode um, of communication. I happen not to love them, but other people do. Uh, so it's nice that it can communicate for different people. Here you can see um, a dependency between two tasks uh, that I set up. Um, so pretty clean and simple. Um, and then the last thing is that it can also take that same spreadsheet, turn it into a calendar, um, and then that calendar can be imported into uh, Outlook or um, Google. So uh, I think it's a really nice, smooth way. Again, this can also be with Teams, um, so many people can, can make edits. And you can use it with a team. The way I've seen it is um, where people can have one person has to make an update. They don't need to be invested in the whole system. They'll get an email saying, please update your column when you finish your, your piece of this project, and people can do that. Um, so that's a smart sheet that we use all the time. So my next few ones are my next few tips are all about uh, the human part of technology. Um, so the first thing that I think is most important is about orienting your team to the tools that you want them to use. Um, so even if you're on a pretty tech savvy team, I think it's really important to sit down and just walk through what's the tool, what are the tools that you're going to use, how do you plan to use them? How do different people want to use them? Um, even if I can figure out Trello on my own, understanding how my coworkers like to use it and like to keep track of things can really make a difference to make sure we're all communicating um, in the same language. And uh, the next piece about communication uh, is to pick up the phone. Um, I think that's the other piece that I see a lot. I, I love email and that I like to send them. I like to think things through that way. Um, but more than once over the past month, I've written a really long email, refined it, edited it, and then realized if I just called the person, I could probably solve the problem more easily. Um, so while I do love, love my email, um, I do think in terms of collaboration tools, I just wanted to remember there are unlimited you know, new Chrome <laughs> extensions out there. And at the end of the day, this old reliable thing called the telephone um, may still be worth worth something. Um, and oh, my last one, I forgot that I had one last one. Um, if you are a graphic person, or in particular, if you are not a graphics person and you are trying to uh, maybe use one of the other design tools that you saw earlier, um, or you're doing something on a website and want some easy iconography, there's a great website called The Noun Project uh, where as you can see, there are all kinds of icons that have often been tested um, in order to, to, to set up your website and make sure that it's readable and understandable. Um, I gotta say, I'm not sure what the tongue at the bottom of the, of the list is there for. Um, and if you really need some ramen, it appears that we have that in the lower right-hand corner. Um, but uh, I find that really great. And the other cool thing is you can also release your own sets. So if any of your organizations create some cool graphics and you want to be known as someone who creates cool, cool or useful graphics in your field, maybe there is going to be some, some legal nerd creating really great legal icons, um, you can add them to the Noun Project. Um, I think they'll have to be open source, and, uh, and then you can make sure that other people use them. And that is it. Great. Um, so I think next up we've got Anna Heimlein from Wami. So uh, tech tips. Um, my first one here is uh, track changes in Google Docs. So one of the biggest issues that I've heard from people um, in trying to get people to transition to Google Docs is that uh, they are unable to do track changes like they were in Microsoft Office products. Um, so recently, Google rolled out the track changes within um, Google Drive and Google Docs. So up in the right-hand corner, there will be, um, you will see that it's, you can be editing, suggesting, or viewing. Um, so if you change that to suggesting, it'll mark up your document, uh, similarly to how it is marked up in Word, um, and leave comments down the side. And then similarly to how you would deal with comments in uh, Google Docs, you can just go through and accept, reject, um, or comment on other people's thoughts about your 
uh, changes to the document. And then if more people are collaborating on the document than just one, um, it'll obviously do their different pictures and colors um, so you can keep track of who's doing what. So I think that was when I first noticed it a couple months ago. Um, I was really excited because it really kind of opens up uh, Google Drive to even more collaboration efforts than it already has. Um, so second here, another Google product, uh, Google Keep. Now Google Keep has been around for a little while now. Um, it's kind of their task, modified task list and to-do list setup. Um, the mobile app for it is really slick. I really like the mobile app a lot, but they just recently built in the ability to share your to-do list. So you can uh, jump on and add different people to your to-do list. So as different items are checked off or completed, everybody on your team can be um, notified of that through this. And now, again, we've all kind of talked about uh, different ways of, of lightweight project management. So this is just another example of that um, for people who live in the Google ecosystem. Um, it's kind of informally built into or informally built into um, into Google Apps. Uh, so, but it's still kind of working on gaining recognition. Um, for some reason, Google's built-in task list through their calendar isn't awesome. Um, so this is just another alternative to that. Um, my next one here is Calendly. Uh, this is it interacts with Google calendars or with Outlook calendars, and it's kind of a a different front end that you can give to your calendar. So when you're scheduling meetings with other people or looking to fill appointments, you can send people a link to this and it'll allow them to see a really basic overview of your calendar and select what meetings um, work best for them. Um, so you're not showing everybody your private meetings and who you're meeting with and when you're going to lunch and where you're going to lunch. Um, it just really kind of allows them to jump in and say, great, I'll take the slot from 9 to 10, and then it will then go back to you and tell you this person has um, arranged for that time, that time slot. Uh, Slack is another big one that's starting to gain uh, some momentum in our community. Um, for those of you who are familiar with IRC from years and years and years ago, it's like IRC but on steroids. Um, it's starting to be become, like I said, more popular in our community and it's being tested as a cross-platform collaboration tool. So like it could potentially be in addition to LS Tech, right? We could have a Slack message board that would allow us to jump on and it's like a big chat room with different channels um, and it's all cataloged in the background. Um, and then, so I've talked to people about using it internally. So, you know, you have your housing practice, if you have a big office or a couple of offices that collaborate on housing. So you can uh, talk about um, issues related to housing law or family law or whatever, so you would have a different board. And then I've also heard people talking about uh, integrating it into their IT help desk. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to use it. I mean, generally it's used by like a lot of startups and a lot of tech companies, um, but it's definitely starting to cross, cross lines a little bit. I mean, personally, I think it's great. Um, but I haven't found a way to integrate it into my daily use yet, so I would love to find a way um, to make that work for um, so I, I would just like to second Slack. Slack is wonderful. Um, getting people to sign up with different domains is something that I uh, need to look into, but I am interested in getting it set up for the LS Tech community. Uh, there's also a general question here, which is calendary. Um, does it work for scheduling with people outside of your organization? I believe it does, yes. Um, I believe you can send it to anybody. Um, so it's more than just viewing a calendar, but you could send it to anybody, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, great, so next um, is another one that's been around for a little bit, if this, then that. Um, so it, you can kind of create these little formulas related to the different platforms that you use. Um, so for example, like if I star an email in Gmail, tell it to create a task list or tell it to put it on a task list or create a reminder so I know that I have to take care of it later. Um, and then to something like more silly, like if it's going, if, you know, queryweather.com, if it's going to rain tomorrow, send me an email. Um, they have this huge long list of recipes and formulas. Um, if you're creative and a little bit uh, 
technically skilled, you can create your own formulas. Um, so it's kind of a really fun way to get some of your other tools to work together, um, as well as, you know, really kind of automate um, a lot of your day-to-day -day tasks so that um, you can kind of work through things in a, in a regular manner. Um, I think the, the location one is not my favorite. Uh, the fact that based on the location of your phone, it'll log whether or not you're at work. Um, so, I mean, it can obviously be pretty powerful. Um, so kind of on that note, um, integration. So a lot, there's so many new awesome tools out there for project management, for your email, for collaboration, for document storage, document management. And in that, there's also a lot of really cool integrations of tools. So when you're selecting new tools, it's important to look at how it can integrate with some of the um, current tools that you use, right? So like, you know, Slack integrates with some cloud-based help desk tools. And, you know, here at Law New York, we just looked for, we were looking for new help desk tools and a big priority was to find one that integrated with Gmail since we're a Google app shop. So when you're trying to fit all these different tools into your workflow, it really is a good idea to see how it integrates with what already exists out there. Another one we got here is portable collaboration. So portable technology is getting really, becoming really, really inexpensive. Um, you can now carry an entire computer in your pocket and just plug it into an HDMI monitor or TV um, to be able to provide trainings or give presentations. Um, it really gives you a little bit more versatility than just carrying around a USB stick, and it's obviously much more convenient uh, than carrying around a laptop. So Intel has a Windows model, a Windows 10 model, or excuse me, a Windows 8 model and a Linux model. Um, Google has announced a Chrome bit, which will have Chrome OS on it, like a Chromebook. And then uh, many of you are probably familiar with Google's Chromecast, which allows you to cast uh, from your phone, tablet, or laptop. And all of these are well under 200 bucks. I think the most expensive one is 150, and that's the Intel's, Intel's uh, Windows version. I know Lenovo just came out with one too, so really becoming um, handy to just be able to plug into the back of a monitor for something from like a help center, uh, if you're able to secure it in a good way, or um, you know, computer labs, help labs, things like that. Um, it's a really inexpensive way to, to also set up uh, those type of situations or for presentations. Um, video conferencing, um, I've probably talked to a bunch of you about this. Uh, this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, after a TIG project here at Law New York, we spent a lot of time looking at different uh, video conferencing software that's out there. And um, it's just really important to note that there are a lot of options and the time period of only being able to buy uh, really expensive point-to-point -point systems is definitely behind us. Um, there's a lot of services that are free or uh, very inexpensive that allow for um, quality video conferencing sessions to happen. Um, and something to keep in mind is if you are looking to uh, do your own video conferencing project, whether it's internal or external with um, government agencies or courts or other human service providers, make sure you talk with the people around you about what they're using. Um, so, you know, you can try and get on the same platform to only increase the ability to communicate and integrate your processes, right? So, I mean, a lot of them, it's easy to switch between, right? We'll jump on uh, Skype or Hangouts because that's what the other person is using, but kind of the more we think about this issue as a community and the more we're able, able to decide um, what we kind of want to use, I think the wider our collaboration is going to spread. Um, the other two are other, two other TIG project results and that some of you may have heard of already. Um, so we've got the new version of the Read Clearly tool, which rolled out at the end of last year. Um, it, was the result of a TIG project with Idaho Legal Aid Services, uh, Urban Insight out in LA, um, Law New York, and Transcend Translations. We updated the Read Clearly glossary as well as um, updated the tool that can get uh, installed on your website, similar to the way you would install a uh, Google Analytics JavaScript 
snippet, um, and then it highlights complicated legal terms and gives people plain language definitions for those legal terms. And um, for more information on that, you can go to Open Advocates website and uh, the Read Clearly page for more information and information on how to install it on your website. Um, the other piece of that is Write Clearly. Um, some of you may remember the older alpha and beta versions of this site um, that Jeff Hogue worked a lot on. So this is kind of the new version that we updated also as part of this TIG. Um, it is now a bookmark uh, bookmarklet that you can just click and drag from the Open Advocate site and put into your bookmark toolbar. And when you click, when you go to a page and you click the bookmark, it allows you to assess that page for plain language. And then it will also give you your Flesh Kincaid score, so the grade level of the of the page, as well as suggestions on how to make it um, more readable and you know synonyms to use or how what words you should replace because they're too complicated, things like that. So again, for both of those, um, check out Open Advocate's website and uh, I'm happy to talk with anybody about those uh, projects. And my final tip here, um, a little bit on the, the more nerdy side, and it also goes against my whole cloud-based collaboration philosophy, and it's definitely not new. Um, Emacs was, is from the 1970s, but is an extremely powerful text editor that a lot of people use for some really complicated programming. Stuff, but my favorite way to use it is for um, my go-to project management or to-do list tool uh, through a feature called org mode. And it really kind of works well with the way that my brain works on projects in terms of the flow of, the in terms of the workflow. And it's super customizable, so you can put in all your dates and, you know, is a project done or do you want to have it to do or is it working or are you waiting on somebody? So you can really customize it to what your needs are. And on one of my other favorite pieces of it is that since it is plain text, if I take this list and copy and paste it right out of my Emacs file and paste it into an email and send it to somebody else who happens to use this, if they copy and paste it into their Emacs file, then they see the exact same thing that I saw um, because of the configuration of Emacs and the way that org mode works. So again, um, a little bit more complicated than some of the other ones, but just uh, thought I'd throw it out there. Um, it also does integrate with Trello, um, which is pretty cool, but uh, that's for another time. So that is all I have for you today, and I will pass it back to um, So hi, everyone, and uh, thanks, uh, Anna, Jesse, um, uh, Jenny, and Tim for your great presentations. Uh, this is the final, we're in the final stretch here of tech tips. Um, so the first one that I have here is uh, one of my go-to tech tips. It's relatively straightforward, but uh, it's the site. Uh, some of you may have, as a joke from your friends, been given this website, lmgtfy.com. Um, uh, also known as Google. Um, I use Google pretty heavily, actually, um, from, for getting answers on different things, um, such as how do I adjust the brightness of my computer to best practices for project managing technology projects. Um, usually I found that that's a really good place to start and can open up the rabbit hole of different resources I can look at. Uh, so definitely encourage you uh, if you're ever bug troubleshooting or have larger, more strategic questions to give Google a try and just type something in the search box and see what see what returns. And the next uh, the next tech tip that I have is the de device mode mobile emulation in Google Chrome. Um, so we live in an era where we're seeing an explosion in the different types of mobile devices um, that, are, that are out there. And as folks working on technology projects, we need to think about it's an extra layer of the fact that people are using different size screens and so they're going to see the content differently. But this tool helps with this a little bit. Um, it's 
web content needs to look and feel great across a variety of devices and network conditions. And the testing, the quality of your mobile experience can sometimes be a little bit um, more complex because of this. But device mode brings the insights of mobile testing to your browser tab through the power of mobile emulation. So um, you can see here on the screen that you can, under device, you can adjust the different devices, how those would interpret um, any content or a website page. And same thing with um, the network. Um, there's, if there's any changes in a person's network, you can see how that might affect uh, might affect the rendering. Uh, I I try to do this um, if I'm working on a web page. Um, I will try to test out content that I've put up on at least uh, one mobile site to see how that looks, um, and then uh, an iPad or, um, just to get a sense of how that looks. And if I'm happy generally with it, um, then I'll move on and uh, feel good about it. But if it's rendered rendering very incorrectly, um, then I'll spend a little bit more time working on the content. Another um, really useful tool um, in thinking about uh, your websites and web projects is, and I know that this has been uh, used as a tech tip in the, ta in the past, but I definitely think it's worth repeating. Uh, this is the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. Um, you can evaluate your, your site from an accessibility standpoint. So this can help you to identify contrast errors. So for example, um, any errors that would cause those with certain visual impairments to have trouble um, processing your site. Um, and understand also how a screen reader might have trouble interacting with your site. Um, those folks with, um, with certain impairments may have trouble uh, and may need to harness a screen reader to uh, interpret sites. And so this, this tool gives you um, an introductory sense to things that you may want to think about. Um, I just ran this on Lifepacker, and as you can see, it returned some errors, um, some contrast errors. This HTML5 in ARIA refers to um, problems that would, uh, problems for screen readers. Um, so definitely worth checking out. Um, if you have a chance. Uh, my next tool, um, similar to, to uh, the tool that was, to the wireframing tool that was uh, discussed earlier is mockups. Um, I find this to be a really helpful wireframing or prototyping tool. It is, there is a free version of it. And I think what I like most about this though is that you're able to take your ideas and put them into a visual format so in some ways, I actually think of this as a communication tool um, that allows me to take, you know, what I have in my mind or on paper and then show it to um, the stakeholders on the project and, and say, is this what you want? Um, and do a little bit more digging and collaborating based on the results of this wireframing tool. My other favorite um, tool that I love to use is there's a Google Analytics plugin for Chrome. Um, the Page Analytics Chrome extension allows you to see how your users interact with your web pages, including what they click and they don't click. And you can use these insights to optimize your website layout, improve user experience, and um, amongst other things. Um, and then as you can see here up at the top, there's this bar that appears. Um, so if I have this plugin turned on, whenever I'm navigating to a site that I have connected to my Google Analytics, this is an example of um, the Olmstead Wright site. Um, it's just showing me on that page what the analytics are. And I just find this to be a really helpful and different view um, than actually going into the Google Analytics tool. Um, I tend to, my mind tends to think a little bit better when I'm actually on that page and, and getting the returns of, of what those analytics are. Um, it, it just helps me process and think through what I'm seeing in a little bit of a different way. And what you can see here are page views, unique page views, average time on page, bounce rate, and percent exit number of, ac of active visitors in real time. Um, and then you can see in-page click analysis, so where users are clicking on the site. Um, 
And then you can also use the Google Analytics state comparison and segmentation tools directly in the extension. Um, so, and then pages you are tracking with the Google Analytics code for an account your Google account login has access to will appear like this in your Chrome browser, as I mentioned before. Uh, I'm just looking back at the comments too. I see that um, Ket, Ket put a comment in, if you ever get an error, paste it into Google um, if you're on a website. I've, I have certainly done that before too, and I, I find it helpful because it gives me a little bit more insight into what, what might be happening with the system. So this is a non, uh, this is a non work related uh, tech tip, but I definitely uh, is one that I probably use the most in my personal life because I love going to see the movies. Um, and this is, is the Run P app, um, and it was created because movie theaters don't have a pause button. Um, this basically is an app. I think it was $3 that I, that I used it to download. Um, I, love, I love going to the movie theater, um, but because I end up paying so much, I don't want to miss anything of the movie, so I downloaded this app. And it basically, every time a new movie comes out, they list it on the Run P app. And there are folks who go and review the movie, and uh, each movie has a list of carefully selected times that you can go and run to the bathroom if you need to. Uh, and they try to find three to five minute long scenes that don't have any crucial plot t twists or comedy moments or exciting action. Um, and it also, um, as an added bonus, lets you know whether there's anything to see during or after the end credits, uh, which is something I always like, you know, should I stay here in the dark movie theater or should I, is, or is there going to be something more? Uh, and then you can set a timer once the movie starts, which will vibrate when you should get up and go to the bathroom. And it's a silent timer, um, so movie, movie theater friendly. And another, um, so this is a, a low tech tech tool um, that I have. Uh, this is actually my desk. I, within the past three months, I would say, I set up a, a new way of doing my work. I wanted to harness um, a, a stand-up desk. And so I, but I didn't want to be standing the whole time, so I also wanted the ability to easily sit down if I needed to. So you can see my chair here. Um, when I'm sitting, I'm sitting in my chair, and uh, I've got my keyboard and mouse here, and then my main monitor that I use when I want to sit down. And then when I want to stand up and work, I just uh, pull, pull my laptop forward and use the keyboard on my laptop and use these two screens. Um, for doing my work. Often try to look at this screen as my main screen for ergonomic purposes. Um, I, this was a pretty easy setup to do. Um, I borrowed this stand from a coworker, um, actually just bought another stand uh, yesterday. Um, but I have found it to be such a boost in my productivity. I'm um, just really able to focus a lot more on um, that, including uh, Jenny's tip with taking, you know, uh, when I hit a slump, taking a 20-minute walk, I come back feeling refreshed and creative and um, ready to go and get, get productive. So um, for those of you who um, are interested in trying this out, um, I strongly recommend it, um, doing, a ha doing a convertible standing sitting scenario. Um, and then the other tech tip that I wanted to uh, mention is this concept of these digital service market, marketplaces um, where there's just been a kind of a flood of these. Um, LinkedIn for good, which is for matching you with volunteers, that's, that's free. Um, volunteer match is also free. Um, then there's some other sites that are paid, um, sites and apps. One is called Fiverr. Um, basically, these are sites where people offer up their services and their skills um, for, for you to connect with volunteers or to get things done that you might need to. Um, Fiverr, uh, you can connect to people who do voiceover work, do translation work. Um, I've seen uh, people offering up business plan writing there. Um, for $5, um, you, can, you can do that. Um, then there's TaskRabbit for um, more um, 
the tasks that involve um, like different chores or um, laundry, for example, I know that um, there was an organization next door to us who got a whole bunch of new IKEA furniture and they hired a task rabbit to help put that together. Um, and then there's Postmates, which is an app. I don't know if, I know for sure it's in San Francisco. I don't know if, what other markets it's been yet, but um, these are folks who can go out and run errands for you. Um, if you're busy at work and you can't step out but you need something to get done, they can do that for you. Um, so definitely worth uh, looking in as a creative way of just kind of getting things done and harnessing um, the work of other people. And my next, um, my next tech tip is XAI. Um, so full disclosure, I am not fully using this. Um, there, I'm on the wait list for this as well, um, but I have received um, emails from someone using XAI. Um, I, I think it's pretty fascinating. It, right now in Silicon Valley, one of the hot things is, uh, is machine learning and artificial intelligence, and so there are some really interesting things that people are doing around this. So a XAI is a personal assistant powered by artificial intelligence that schedules meetings for you. So um, it lets you use email to schedule meetings. Um, you speak to Amy at XAI as you would to any other person, and you can have her do all the tedious email ping pong that comes along with arranging a meeting. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a waiting list currently, but I've been on the other side of someone using this. Um, I emailed him. He said, okay, great, I'm going to email Amy to set up a meeting. And the whole time I thought I was interacting with a real person uh, until I realized, I, I thought, Amy Ingram, that's, that's an interesting name, and I, I was like, that, that's got to be something uh, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and surely enough, um, I realized it was AI doing all of this work. So um, worth checking out and some of the other cool, cool things that are coming into the marketplace around that. And um, I'm going to pause here briefly. Um, yeah, Caroline, I see your um, I see your note about the services. I'll go ahead and um, push those out into the chat at the end for you. Um, so yeah, we'll the next also point, try to add those to the blog post later. Okay, great. Yeah, and uh, it, the comments are in the slides, so they'll be in the slides that are posted. Um, and then my other. Um, my other um, favorite tool to use is Feedly. Uh, it's a news aggregator that, um, that can be used on various web browsers and mobile devices running iOS and Android, and it's also available as a cloud-based service. But what it essentially does is it compiles news feeds from a variety of online sources for the user to customize and share with others. Um, what I particularly use this for is two things. One, um, I like to keep up to date on relevant news. Um, so for me, I have two different types, types of news. I have access to justice news that I like to stay on the loop on. Um, and then there's a series of tech news that I also like to keep up to date on. So um, I find this is just a really good way to go in and start my morning at work um, to get my brain kind of going. Um, and then the other thing that I use it for is um, if you do content curation, if you're involved in that in any way on your site, this is a really great way to help you curate content um, all in one place so that you have one place to go and look and you can pull the relevant um, information to add to your site. I do this um, for, or we have a Feedly set up for our organization to keep the, um, the, the news tool on Pro Bono Net populated. Um, and I think in some cases the calendar tool as well. And then uh, my final tip here is to just avoid recreating the wheel. Um, there are some really great uh, legal tech community resources. Um, we've got a plethora of resources for folks working on tech content management projects, and I just want to make sure that 
um, you all are aware of these great tools and certainly taking advantage of them. Um, so a great starting point is the LSN Tap Library um, for anything tech-related. Uh, Pro Bono Net also has a um, statewide website um, coordinator, content coordinator library for tools and resources for those, those uh, doing project management of those sites. Uh, the LS Tech Listserv is also really good to tap into your peers and ask questions about, hey, have you done X or Y? Um, and you often get a great response. There's also ShareLaw Video and ShareLaw.org. Um, these are sites where you can find assets for video projects um, and for other content to share onto your site and, um, or to recreate in your own, your own way. Um, and then also there's, just a reminder, there's um, some content sharing capabilities on both LawHelp and Pro Bono Net for those of you who are on LawHelp and Pro Bono Net sites um, to tap into that to just share out resources as appropriate. So that wraps up um, today's discussion. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for attending. Uh, the next um, LSN TAP PBN um, uh, webinar that we'll be holding is on process mapping for civil legal services, small investments with a big impact, which will be held July 15th. Um, Brian, are there any other LSN TAP um, trainings um, in between them beyond yes. the pro bono? Uh, we have one um, specifically on looking at innovations um, uh, both outside and inside uh, legal services um, put on by Idealware July 9th, um, and we may be scheduling one on analytics sometime in July. Uh, I'm still working with the organization that's finishing up that TIG. Um, but uh, the trainings area on the LSM TAP website definitely keeps those up to date, and they are all being done at this URL that we're at currently. Uh, join me. So, Great. Thank you guys so much for putting this together. There is a survey link in the chat. Um, if people could take two minutes and fill out that survey, we'd greatly appreciate it. It helps us inform what webinars we put on next year, and anything to change for a presentation, that type of stuff. Um, thank you, guys.